Hi gang, and welcome back to the Craft Beer Channel. For me, uh, I'm, I mean, I missed out on the Imperial Stout Brownies, but at least today I've got some amazing stouts, some Bourbon County Stout, don't we, Johnny? We do. So we're going to do a very special video asking the question, what is Imperial Stout? And it turns out uh, the world doesn't really know. It seems that whenever you dive into beer history, you end up talking like you've drunk a lot of Imperial Stout, and there's probably going to be a lot of awkward pauses uh, um, and ums mm. and heads in hands as we try to wrestle uh, with the definitions of Russian Imperial Stout. So, like any beer history lesson should start, should we crack the beer? Of course, mate. I refer to this beer as a free pass. So I think there are some beers in this world that even when they have horrible ownership, uh, you just have to just bow down and go, yes, that is one of the best beers in the world and treat it as such. And Bourbon County Stout from Goose Island falls under that. Do you agree? Yeah, man, it's got the heritage. It's It's got the frigging barrel aging amazingness. It's got the complexity. It's got the history. Now it has the owners that we didn't want it to have. But, you know, eh, I don't know what to say, Johnny. I mean, this stuff is, is gold. Yeah, it is still my favourite Imperial Stout. A couple have come incredibly close, but I still every day yearn for that rich biscuit, biscoff, boozy, bourbony, vanilla-y, oaky, chocolate, coffee hit. It's just the most complex and beautiful beer. Um, but I think it comes from the fact they've been making this beer for so long and they've come to understand the processes with the wood and with the recipe that they that they use. Oh, and a fuck ton of money for Q for a Q and A. <laughs> it's just silly good, isn't it? I'm speechless. These big, massive stouts that are syrupy. They're just too syrupy. They're like an oil slick. But this is, it's so smooth. It's so warming. It's quite gentle. It's, it's roasty, it's toasty. But it's, it's just, it's velvet, isn't it, mate? Yeah. I mean, it's balance, isn't it? That's what so many of these big pastry stouts are missing. Whereas this has, you know, coconut, vanilla, brown sugar. But it's balanced by coffee, heavy roast and loads of oak as well, which dries it out. So everything's, everything's in proportion with each other. And that's what makes a really special big beer. Like we sometimes think of big beers being dominated by one particular thing. In fact, in big beers, it's almost more important to be balanced. You know, I'm, I'm fine with my Munich Hellers being really malty. I'm fine with my Lambics being really bretty. But when I have something this big, if something's really spiky, it's not going to be that drinkable. So I hope that's given you a little idea of what a Russian Imperial Stout should be. Obviously, mine is the barrel aging. Um, that's a new thing that the Americans sort of added in their own American way. Hey, that's cool. Let's completely change it. Um, Although there is a small link in that most of the uh, beers that we're about to talk about as we go through the history of Russian Imperial Stout, if that is a thing, um, would have been uh, perhaps fermented and transported in oak. So there might have been some oak character, although there might have been a pitch lining that might have protected it from it. Um, so, Brad, what do you think the history of Imperial Stout is? Okay, so my point of history basics, it's a really, really strong British beer that we used to brew for the Russians because they like it strong and it's bloody cold over there. The idea was that it wouldn't freeze on the way over. That's the romantic thing that I think it's about. Yeah, so that's the cliche. We brewed it much stronger so it wouldn't freeze on the way. Um, so I was researching this, trying to work out if it was true. And a very good point was made on my favourite beer history website, Zitherfile, that if it was so cold that the beer would freeze, the water the boat was in would freeze as well. <laughs> so the boat wouldn't actually be able to get there. So scientifically, that doesn't quite work. So it's actually more likely the little thing that you said in passing, which is that that's just how the Russians liked it. You know, it's cold. They love vodka. They wanted something warming. It's probably just like literal personal taste. And even more than that, it's probably that much like today where we love our big, strong, bold, flavorful beers. You know, ABV to some extent is considered a marker of quality. Um, and I think that would have been true back then, like a 7% stout, an 8% stout, a 9% stout would have been seen as higher quality, more ingredients, more flavour than a 4% stout. Yeah, and I guess it would be 
uh, obviously way more flavoursome and, you know, the journey wouldn't necessarily hurt the flavours on the way over. No, if it was sat there in that barrel um, at a nice low temperature, it probably might mature quite nicely as it went. But we weren't calling it Russian stout, we weren't calling it Imperial stout, it was, it was in fact porter. So the difference between porter and stout, which we've said many times on this channel, back then was strength. So you had porter and then you had stout porter, which was just stronger porter. As in like a stout, a stout yeah, gentleman. That's the like way you to me. sort of think about it, isn't it? And try and remember it. It's like you're really stout and you're strong. Yeah, I picture those guys in the in the like the leotard things doing weights and having moustaches and going, what, what? strong men. So the history of Imperial Russian stout then basically becomes semantics. Like, where did we start getting these other words from that just denoted this strong thing that we started sending? Um, so the start of that history seems to be that as Russia, you know, I, I don't want to be rude to Russia for very obvious reasons, but they tend to have beef with people. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think it's fair to say, you know, they might have beef with you because of who you like to kiss. Or, or which particular president you might want to criticise. Um, so they were having some beef with lots of countries and they decided uh, sometime in the 1700s, I think, to whack a load of uh, extra tariffs, charges, taxes on some imported goods. Now, something that survived that tax hike was porter because London porter, the, the dark beers brewed in London, had such a good reputation that they managed to convince the rest of the world they're like, you couldn't make it like we can. Our water's too perfect, our British grain is too good, blah, 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 blah. So they didn't tax hike uh, the porters. So that's how so much stuff was going over to Russia. It was that revered that... Yeah, very even, much, very much loved Russians, by nations all over. Massive alcohol slash alcoholic fans loved it so much that they didn't impose their taxation on it. Exactly. And, you know, they weren't like, we are Russia, we can make it better than you. They, they thought, actually, very much like Scotch whiskey or something, they were into it. So we're selling an absolute ton of porter or potentially stout to Russia. So where does imperial and Russian come from? So the Russian, that's kind of obvious. So we were calling it Russian stout because we were brewing strong beer for them because they liked it um, and sending it to Russia. So a Russian stout, that makes sense. Imperial's a little bit trickier because as far as we can tell, the first reference to Imperial seems to come from a reference to, uh, uh, I think, a brown ale uh, from Ireland, like an Imperial brown ale. And I'm not aware of any em Irish empire. Mm. It's a little bit strange, but it does seem that Imperial probably did come from the fact that uh, Russian oligarchs, Tsars, the royal family also loved porter and there's lots of historical evidence of them saying how much they love it serving it at banquets um i think one of one of the female uh stars i forget maybe charlotte might have been her name um boasted that she could drink as much stout as any english gentleman <laughs> that's great so they were they were bigging up their ability to drink porter in large quantities uh, back then so that's possibly where it came from. It was probably like so many beer terms. It was a marketing term. It was probably some breweries going, if this is good enough for the Tsar of Russia, then it's probably good enough for you. And also at that, at that point, the Russian royal family, the British royal family, the German royal family, they were all like Saxe Coburgs and, and that. And they were yeah, like they weren't just cousins. friends. They were um, probably, well, I was, I was going to say family, but they're also probably lovers. Lovers and family. That's how royals work. <laughs> but if you, if you look back at historical photos, they all look the same. I mean, I'm by no means a royalist. They look cool. They look amazing in their regalia and stuff. So, you know. They just all got vacant smiles. Very, yeah, very vacant. Because of the limited gene pool. But um, they can drink for England or drink for Russia, as it might be. The, the weird thing in history comes with the fact that. Russian and Imperial weren't ever really used together. And yet we call them Imperial Russian Stouts. Um, and in fact, they were actually possibly different beers. So your Russian Stout was the stronger version of your Stout or your Porter that you sent 
to Russia, or the recipe was what you'd brew to send to Russia. You then had the imperial, and the imperial became this catch-all term for the strongest version of that particular style that you make. So every brewery would have its imperial stout, it might have its imperial porter, even though that was less than its imperial stout. It might have its imperial brown stout. It might have its imperial pale ale. It might have its imperial IPA. So that explains how we saw it being used in Ireland. But the actual connection with Russian imperial court with royalty is a little bit harder to prove, I think, at the moment. I could be wrong. And if you know better, I'd love to see it in the comments. But so there's a little bit of a weirdness around that. And then I think because we made that connection without ever having much proof, it became the Imperial Russian stout. Because it's like, well, it was the Imperial Court of Russia and it was a stout we sent them. So it's an Imperial Russian stout. Or it could just be the strongest Russian stout a brewery made. So it was the Imperial Russian stout if they made lots of different Russian stouts. And then, of course, you've got people saying, uh, you know, this is our Imperial Porter but you don't have a stout, so isn't it just a stout? And then and then your brain explodes. Mate, it's so confusing, isn't it? And it's kind of nonsense. So what does that mean in modern terms? Firstly, it means history is confusing. Secondly, when it comes to actually defining these beers, it's now come back to flavour. So like we have with porters and stouts, originally they were just different strengths. Now, a porter is seen as fruity, a bit less roasty, more rounded. Um, a stout is seen as like a Guinness, so it's much drier. It's much more got much more roasted character. Um, so an imperial stout then, further down that line, which should just mean a stronger stout, that's now come to be like a, a boozy, sweet... So you've got more residual sugar left over, so it's sweeter generally. Uh, it probably won't have much hop character. So it's seen as a decadent dessert kind of beer. And that's how we d separate those three styles now. I think that's a. I think you summed it up there, and that's that's the only way we're going to stay sane, Johnny, is if we try and define it. I love I love the idea that history is kind of flexible as well, isn't it? So, are we are we talking the truth? His history is written by written by the winners, right? Exactly. Which is also true in beer because it means that you know the beers that sold the best were probably the ones that were marketed best, which probably means they're the ones that said, hey, if the SARS are drinking this, so should you. So there's probably so many examples of big stouts being referred to just as Imperial Stout or Imperial Porter or just Stout, but they weren't marketed as well as the ones that we have historical records of because we kept those because they were the biggest selling beers and those ones were called Imperial Russian Stouts or Russian Stouts or Imperial Stouts. Um... Yeah, so I'm going to have a lie down, only <laughs> partly because of the alcohol, also because of the, the verbal acrobatics that I've just been doing. Uh, I'd love to know what your favourite Imperial Stouts are. I'd love to know if you know beer history better than us and can point us towards some gaps in our knowledge. But most importantly, we would love you guys out there to crack into your beer stash and crack your Imperial Stouts. If you've had them kicking around for a long time, now is the time. Open them. Absolutely. So, yeah, if you do that, go onto whatever social media platform you prefer and use the hashtag uh, Beer Stash and we'll be able to pick that up and we might share them and read them out in our Friday 5pm podcast, which comes out when, Brad? Friday 5pm, Johnny. Friday 5pm. And we'll read them out there. Um, otherwise, comment in the comments box below. There's more details and the article which we quoted throughout is also in the descriptions box. We will see you guys next week after a long, old sleep. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Just cheers to your face. <laughs>